Hi, I'm Sue Roffey. Um, I've been a teacher, parent, educational psychologist and academic and um, a writer. And I'm pretty passionate about what's happening in our schools today. Although we've, you know, we can talk about the problems that kids have in education, I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of schools and teachers out there doing their level best for kids, often under quite challenging circumstances. Teacher well-being, I think, is you know under threat as well as as, as other people's in school because they are. Um, they're micromanaged, they have to fill in all these bits of paper all the time, so they don't have time for actually developing relationships with the kids, and that's what they want to do. And many of them are spending extra time trying to do that, trying to find out about the kids, and I think they, uh, they're, they're struggling because of the demands that are on them, and sometimes the expectations that are just, in many cases, just unreasonable. It isn't like that everywhere. I recently had a really wonderful conversation with Maureen McKenna, who's the Director of Education in Glasgow, and they are building a framework across all Glasgow schools, which is about developing a nurture framework. So they're using principles of nurture in all of their schools. And they say that although curriculum is um, there's advise, advisory curriculum, but they're leaving it up to schools because schools are about what's on offer in terms of the curriculum, the, uh, the pedagogy and the teaching approaches, and the school environment, and all of those matter for an effective education that's actually going to meet the needs of young people. And then a lot of times the curriculum doesn't. If the curriculum is about a teacher standing and delivering and... Um, not engaging young people in the application or the critical thinking around all of that, then it's not necessarily going to meet the needs of a fast-moving future. Things are not the same now as they were 10, 20 years ago. We do have social media, and there are problems with social media to some extent, but learning can be actually self-directed. Kids need to know about how to research information, how to be critical about the information they find, how to talk with others about that stuff and how to apply it, and, how, and what are the ethics of application. All of those things matter in a really good educational framework, rather than being saying, you need to learn these, you know, these rules of grammar in order to you know, pass your SATs. I have written, I've lost count now of the number of books that I've written, but there's a lot of them, many of them, well, several of them translated. I don't know about all those rules of grammar and I haven't needed them. Kids don't need them. A lot of kids don't need them. We're not actually teaching kids what they need for a really flourishing future. Well, I think that to some extent, um, Training is important and at the moment there's an awful lot of schools who don't have the funding for ongoing training. Um, but it has to be hand in hand with things at the macro level, you know, the socio-political demands on teachers. In terms of behaviour, I don't, I've written many books um, around behaviour, but my approach is not about management, it's actually about behavioural change. And my view is that, um, yes, when something happens in a class, you do need to know what to do about it at that time, but you need to know how do you promote positive behaviour in the school, what's involved in doing that, um, how do you give kids agency so that they have a say, how do you, how do you encourage teachers to um, not jump to conclusions about what that behaviour means, usually it's something that that child is communicating. Reward and punishment, I'm going to say this very loudly several times, <laughs> Reward and punishment doesn't work to change behaviour, you know. It might actually stop it at the time it's actually happening, but it doesn't change behaviour overall. Relational approaches are the things that change behaviour. And you need to actually think about behaviour being chosen from the inside out, not the outside in. It's about, you know, driving at a sensible speed, because that's a safe way of driving, rather than only slowing down when there's a speed camera there. That's, that's basically the difference. So it's important that teachers actually know about some of the basic neurological um, 
issues around children's behaviour. I mean, more, most importantly, things like the amygdala. If a child is, uh, if something has happened to a child, first of all, um, they're going to feel under threat. Um, and their amygdala, which is part of the limbic system of their brain, which deals with emotions, and is often linked to emotional memory. So if something's triggered it, um, they might have a meltdown, right? If a teacher goes too close to a child, either with their fingers or their face or their person, it increases the threat. It throws fuel onto a fire. So the teachers need to know some really sensible strategies, which is basically to take a step back, not a step forward, and not to ask the child what they're doing. Because you can't think straight when you're in meltdown. No one can. And they can't learn when they're in meltdown either. So they need actually a break. In all, and then somebody needs to actually ask them, you know, sensible questions. But a lot of the questions about why are you doing this, you won't get an answer which says, because I saw my dad hit my mum this morning, um, because kids will not say that to you. But it's about how you um, treat children with respect in the way that you would like them to treat you. They might not, and not to take those things personally. Because a lot of the time, yes, you can make it worse, but basically, by and large, it's not to do with you. And there are teachers, and I do lots of work around relationships in schools, and there are lots of teachers who work with these frameworks about positive relationships, and they'll tell me over and over again, this works in a way that teachers who actually only want to control children and use punishment doesn't work. It might have everybody sitting silently for that class, but as soon as that class goes on to the next teacher, all hell breaks loose. It doesn't work overall because it doesn't change behaviour from the inside out, and that's what we need to be looking at. Well, there are, um, there are some people, there's, some, there's a psychology service in Hampshire who are using Aspire um, to actually develop well-being across a whole school. They think that the principles apply across the board, and I think that they do as well. Um, and they've been doing what they call Aspire walks, walking around schools saying, you know, let's, let's take photographs of where we can see these things sort of, you know, actually in place. And they could be used for kids like, I can remember when I was working as an ed psych, um, a youngster, a, little, a girl in year seven whose behaviour was you know, hard, hard to manage and the school had got um, girls going, it was a girls school, going on report so they take around this scrappy little bit of paper for teachers to sign in every lesson, completely meaningless and there was a wonderful um, deputy head teacher and he and I worked together to talk to this youngster to say, to say what do you think you can manage? Three targets. What do you think you can manage? So she came up with three things that she thinks she'd have a really good go at in her classes. And we wrote it down in a book that she was allowed to sort of decorate. It was all beautifully done. And she took this book around with her. And teachers were asked not to write anything negative, but just to comment if she'd managed to achieve her own targets that day. And she didn't achieve them all the time in every circumstance, but she certainly made progress. So we were able to have really lovely conversations with teachers and with her mum to sort of, you know, you know, you can be proud of your daughter because, you know, she has chosen to do this and she's managed it. So instead of having a meeting in which there was lists of misdemeanours, you know, there was something that actually was positive and positive grows positive, you know? This girl is now going to see herself differently, think about herself differently, think that she's actually got agency, she's got a say, she's got a voice, she's, you know, her mum's proud of her, she's proud of herself. But the other thing that happened is that we had other girls coming and asking to go on the same report, you know? That is a way of actually bringing agency into practice. Another inclusion is um, youngsters who, in a circle framework, actually are faced with a, a scenario. It's a made-up scenario, right? And somebody reads it out, and this is in the new uh, edition of Circle Solutions for Student Wellbeing. Um, I've done about six or seven scenarios. And one of them is about a boy who is great at football, and he plays for the school, and he's really good. When they play away matches, there are other kids in other schools who make monkey noises at him because he's black, right? So that's the scenario, and we know that that has happened. So the, the question to all of the class, and they work in groups of three or four to start with, and they're asked, 
first of all, how would you feel if you were that kid? Right? So it's right to what would it be if this was you? How would you feel if you were that kid? What would you want to happen? What do you think this class could do to support this boy if he was in your class? So you're asking them to come up with the solutions. You can do that for including people. You can do that for guidelines. You can do that with a whole range of things. Another one is about a boy who's got two dads. Another one, and there's a last one about a girl who's got Down syndrome. And the class are actually really inclusive and supportive of her. So rather than having a negative scenario, we've got a positive one. And we're again asked, what do you think this girl feels about coming to school? And when you put it over to the kids, you're giving them that, that voice, that agency. And we under estimate what kids can come up with when they're given the chance. They're usually not given the chance. They're told this is the rules and you have to abide by them.